you might want to make your little list of participants as small as you can get it so you don't cover up parts of the screen, especially when we get in the actual Lightroom. Uh, we're going to start out with a couple of slides here that if you've used Lightroom before, you will find this part really boring. Um, but this is intended for people that are brand new to Lightroom Classic. So just to clarify, Lightroom Classic, there's two versions. There's Lightroom and Lightroom Classic. Um, and there's monthly subscriptions that will get you one or both of them. Um, Lightroom Classic, which we're talking about tonight, you save and store your photos on your own computer, which means you should back them up yourself because nobody else is gonna do it for you. Where regular Lightroom say, saves everything to the Adobe Cloud out in the internet somewhere, it will end up costing you extra because they charge depending on how much cloud space you use. So once you exceed the little bit they give you, then your, your monthly fee is gonna go up. It has a different interface layout. It doesn't really look like Lightroom Classic. Um, oops. And when you go to sign up, Adobe makes this a default because it wants you to pay more. So you gotta look hard and make sure you get Lightroom Classic. So there are a couple $10 a month subscriptions. The first one is you get Lightroom, Lightroom Classic and Photoshop and 20 gig of cloud storage. This is what we'll be talking about tonight. This is what I use. Um, there's another one where you just get Lightroom, the cloud version and a terabyte of cloud storage for the same price, but you don't get Photoshop or Lightroom Classic. And there are other options. Adobe makes a lot of products you can subscribe for. And there's always somebody in the crowd that doesn't want to pay a monthly fee. So if you do the math, you're not, when you buy the software, you pay a big fee up front and then you pay an upgrade fee every year or so. And it ends up being a wash either way in most cases. And when you say you're buying it to own it, you're not really buying it, you're licensing it. If you owned it, you could sell it. <laughs> but that's frowned upon because it's in the license agreement and you can't do that. When you get a subscription, you get new updates and releases as they come out. So every month or two, there'll be a new feature or something in Lightroom Classic. Um, and of course, bug fix, fixes and that kind of stuff. You know, they come out multiple times over the year. You never know when, but. And if you stop paying your monthly subscription, you don't really lose anything except for the ability to make additional adjustments or edits to your photo. Lightroom Classic still works, except you're no longer allowed to develop them until you start paying again. So most programs, people that are familiar with, you open a document, you edit it and resave it. This is like Excel, Word, PowerPoint, Photoshop, Photoshop elements. Um, this is not how Lightroom Classic works. You need to get over that hump. <laughs> it's not even close to how Lightroom Classic works. And just a brief overview on how it does work. You start Lightroom Classic you import your photos into Lightroom Classic. All this does is allow Lightroom Classic to know where your photos are on your computer. All this information is saved in the Lightroom Classic catalog, which is basically the brains of the whole operation. The catalog is, some, is a big file stored somewhere on your local computer, wherever you told it to do. First time it you start Lightroom Classic and ask you where you want to put your catalog. If you already have photos on your computer that you've used with Photoshop or some other program, um, you import them in the Lightroom Classic with the add option. And that just tells Lightroom Classic the location of where your photos are. It doesn't do anything else. If you 
go out shooting and you have a memory card with photos on it, you can import those into your Lightroom Classic and copy them to your hard drive at the same time. This is what you'll be doing most of the time after the very first time you get there. And then once Lightroom Classic knows where all your photos are, you can make edits to them. All your edits are recorded in the catalog. Your actual photos on your computer are never modified. In fact, Lightroom Classic doesn't have the ability to actually change your photos. That's very important. So you make all these adjustments and edits and it shows up on your screen with all the adjustments applied, but those changes are in the catalog. It doesn't change your original photos. So you never have to worry about screwing something up and destroying your photos. You can always start over. And there's no save function in Lightroom Classic because it can't overwrite your photos. All the adjustments are recorded in the catalog. So once you've finished editing your photos and you want to print them or send them out to be printed or post them on social media or email them or whatever you want to do with them, you export the photo out of Lightroom Classic. This creates a new photo on your computer with all the edits baked in. You usually export to a JPEG file, but other formats are available. And then with the after, during the export, you can the export function allows you to reduce the resolution of your photos, add a watermark, compress them, rename them, specify which folder they go in. You know, there's a lot of options in the export setup. You know, the, the export dialog rather. So what I usually do in Lightroom Classic is I'll start Lightroom Classic, insert the, my camera's memory card in my computer. I'll import the new photos, tell them which folder I want them to be stored on on my computer. And I also do a little routine, it automatically renames them, but you don't have to do that if you don't want to. And then I look through the photos and delete the bad ones. And then I select the photos I want to work on right now. And then I work on those photos. I make adjustments to them. I'll export them to my desktop in JPEG format, which automatically reduces the size because they don't have to be full resolution for where they're going. I add a faint watermark. I get out of Lightroom Classic. I make sure my photos and catalog are backed up. I'll upload the new exported JPEGs I just created to Facebook. I'll delete the JPEGs from my desktop. And if I ever need them again, I can create them just by going back into Lightroom Classic and tell them to export again. So there's no need to keep a duplicate copy around. The Lightroom Classic does a whole lot more than just photo editing. It's big into organizing your files so you can find them later, especially when you get a whole bunch of photos. They have collections. You can add keywords to the photos. You can rate them with star ratings and color ratings and pick flags. You can search by date. You can search by the EXIF info in the photos themselves. And you can either sync some of them with the cloud, which I'll talk about a little bit later if we have time. <laughs> Lightroom also gives you your own personal photo web page if you want it. It's easy to set up. There's a map function if your photos are GPS tagged. There's a print module if you have your own printer. It can create slideshows, photo books, web pages. Couple tips. Once your photos have been imported, don't touch them. Oops. Don't touch them with a different program like 
Finder or Windows Explorer or anything like that, because if you move them around and Lightroom Classic won't be able to find them anymore because it's still looking at the location in the catalog. And if you need to move them or something, rename them, whatever, use the built-in file manager in the Lightroom Classics library modules. And be sure you know the location of your catalog and make sure it gets backed up. It may or may not be on the same physical hard drive as your photos themselves. And you wanna keep your catalog on the fastest drive on your computer to maximize your performance. So personally, I keep the catalog on a solid state drive internal to my computer and I keep my photos on an external hard drive which is slower, but there are, you know, are on two different separate drives. So I make sure they both get backed up. And we can switch to a little demo and actually start Lightroom and see what happens here. Yeah, you know, we're not gonna cover everything given <laughs> the time constraints here. So let's switch over to Lightroom Classic. Ooh. I can find it here. I thought I had it right. There we go. I'm assuming everybody can see my screen here with Lightroom Classic running on it. If not, unmute yourself and speak up because I'm going to start playing with these photos here. We can see it. I can see it, but I'll tell you, it's really small. I mean, like I'm on my second monitor and some of the stuff, the printing and stuff on the left hand side is real small, but maybe it won't be once you start getting into. It's full screen screen on my computer. So, okay. That's all we can ask for. Yeah. So maybe I just have a few example photos here, but we'll start out with. I might you here. Up to the top right, you have the different modules, the library module, the develop module, the map module, etc. Right now we're in the library module. So this has basically, these are the folders. That are on my physical hard drive on the left here. Underneath that, we have collections, which are kind of like folders, except they're virtual folders. You can drag photos from anywhere into these to group them together. So these photos are from different folders in my actual hard drive, but I grouped them here. So if I look at the first one here, down at the bottom, there's this toolbar. And you can turn the toolbar off and on by hitting the letter T or doing the menu selection. And you'll see we're in grid view now, which shows a thumbnail of each photo. And you can adjust the size of your thumbnails. If I go into loop view, it'll show the photo I have selected. And there's a few other views like for comparing photos if you want to compare them side by side and that kind of stuff. I'm not going to get into that too much. Um, the right hand side, we have the histogram. They have a quick develop, which I never use. You have the ability to add keywords to your photos, like you could put location or person's name or whatever you want. You can make up your own keywords. And then you have your EXIF info here. This was shot with a Nikon Z50. I'll tell you the lens, the ISO, all the different camera settings, the resolution, the date and time it was shot. So down at the bottom, you have a film strip so I can switch between photos just by clicking on it here and not having to go back to grid view. 
And you can also turn on the search by hitting the backslash or through the menu. And then you can search by, you know, if I only want to see photos shot with a particular camera or a particular lens or And you can search just the folder or collection you, you're in, or you can search everything. So it comes in handy for finding your files sometimes. And then if we go over to the develop module, which is where you make your adjustments. And one of the, like, there's a lot of ways to make adjustments here. It's all personal preference. It's to your taste. Um, Adobe recommends that you start at the top and work your way down. So these kind of adjustments should be made before the ones on the bottom. So, but you can do them in any order you want to. It's really up to you. If, as long as you have a newer version, you know, a current version of Lightroom Classic, the first thing you can do to make your life easier is come next to tone here and press the word auto. This was kind of broken in older versions of Lightroom. So if you have one like Lightroom 6 where you're not paying the monthly sub subscription, you may not want to do this because it usually caused more harm and good back in those days. So if I press auto here, first thing it does is it sets the sliders for me and makes the photo look better. Now you can use this just as a starting point. And so for this photo, I may want to bump up the clarity. The other thing you can do if you're shooting raw, you can change the color profile. If I change this to Adobe Landscape, it makes the colors a little brighter. Um, and then this little line of tools above basic here are very useful. First one is crop. And if, we'll start out with crop here. So if I wanted to crop this, I could just hit that. We're at the original aspect ratio. The crop is locked. I can unlock it if I want a non-standard crop or I can leave it locked. If I leave it locked, I can move it around and it'll always stay the same aspect ratio. So I could do something like that. I could decide if I want more sky or more ground, move it around a little bit, hit enter and it's cropped. So the next one, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna reset the crop. I don't want to crop it yet. I want to do this first. This is the, what do they call this? Spot removal tool. Okay. If you look really close, I have some dust spots on my photo here. So the other thing you can do, you see the little plus sign on my cursor. If I hit that, it zooms into 100%. So I can actually see these dust spots a little better. I can go back to the spot removal tool and I can make the little tool as big as I want by using keyboard shortcuts or just scrolling with the mouse wheel, which is what I was doing there. Go over top of it, hit enter and that one's gone. I could go over to this one, hit enter and that spot's gone. Oops, I did not want to do that. If you make a mistake, you can hit delete and get rid of that one. If you hit the space bar, it turns the cursor into a hand so I can drag it around and find some more. And there's one big one down at the bottom I wanted to show you. There's kind of a, it's not a round one. Now, a couple options here. I could do a big spot removal or I could come back to the normal size and just drag it. And that one's gone. And go back. Okay, there's other options up here too. This one's red eye removal, which we're not gonna demonstrate. 
that requires a person that was shot with a flash, which I don't have here. There's a graduated filter. So you could think of this as, you can do presets for this too, but this is one I sometimes use on the sky, like a graduated ND filter. So I could start at the top and just drag it down if I wanted to darken the sky. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about it being too dark because I can always change it later after I get the filter in place. I could hit that, hit delete, and start over if I wanted to really. See, this is more of a graduated ND. If I wanted a hard ND filter, I could start here and drag down. So, and there's also a brush in here that if I wanted to paint out what's selected from the mountain so it doesn't darken those, I could do that too by getting the brush tool over here and then selecting a race. And so we could do something like that. Go back to the spot removal tool. I see I got another one up here that showed up after I did that. Okay. And then there's radial filters. So if I wanted to emphasize something, I could lighten up the area of my photo. This is not the best example to do that on. So let's pop over to here and do the same thing, hit auto, maybe bump up the contrast, not the exposure. The other trick is if you double click on a, the word or the little slider, it'll reset it to zero. So I could bump up the contrast, maybe add some clarity, vibrant saturation, whatever. So maybe increase the exposure a little bit. But if I lay the exposure low and it's, say I wanted to emphasize the mountain here, I could create a radial filter around it. And I can move that over here. And the trick to that is I usually use invert. That means that everything inside the oval is what I'm adjusting. So if I double click on effect, and maybe I want to bring up the exposure here to lighten up those mountains a little more, or maybe just do it with shadows so it doesn't affect the sky so much, or a combination of this. So you can, you can change the shape of it. You can use it to lighten or darken certain parts of your photo. That's a creative part that you'll have to decide for yourself. So with those, you can go back and select them later if you wanted to change something. You can turn it off and on so you can see the effect it makes down here. And if I go back here, I can get rid of that. There's another way to do it, and that's using the brush tool, which is the last one here. So I can, Suppose I wanted to increase the highlights and exposure. I could go in here and then I could just paint in the adjustment to wherever I wanted it. And you see, I've got the flow rate set low. So the more times I go over it, the brighter it gets. And again, I can make the adjustments afterwards hmm. to fine tune the actual exposure I'm getting here. So let's go back to the library module and the grid view here, which is just hit the letter G. There are other neat things you can do. Suppose you were over at Glen Canyon and you wanted a picture of the dam like that, but you didn't have a wide enough lens. You could 
Okay, let me back up. You see this little six here? That's a set of stacked photos. If I click on the six, it unstacks them or shows them to me. So what I did here is I took this picture, moved the camera a little bit to the left, took another picture, another picture, another picture, another picture. And then if you go in here and you select them all, right click, photo merge, panorama. Thinks about them for a minute. And it will stitch them together for you. And because I was hand holding this, there's going to be parts around the edge that aren't covered. You have a couple different, you have three different options. You can just crop that out with the auto crop button. Or if you wanted a little more foreground and you don't want it cropped out, you can warp the photo. So basically stretch it so it fits inside the frame. Or you can use the automatic fill feature that takes it a minute or so, but it will use Photoshop's content aware fill and fill in the edges for you. And then you hit merge and it will save this as a brand new photo on your hard drive. So, and you can do the same thing with if you're shooting bracketed, exposure bracketed, you can go to photo merge and merge them to HDR. So, and that's what I did to the actual photo here. If you really want to get fancy, you notice this one has 20 photos in it. Basically, I shot bracketed for five photos, moved the camera up to the left a little bit, shot five more and five more. You select all these, right click, photo merge, and you could go to HDR and panorama. So we'll combine the bracketed ones and uh, HDR and we'll stitch them all together as panoramas all in one step, which is a really nice feature. And I'm not gonna do that right now because that one takes it a couple minutes. And then you can get something that looks like that when you get done. So let's see, what am I missing here? There are, if I go back to develop, hit the letter D. Besides the basic panel, which you probably spend most of your time in, there's also a tone curve if you like doing that. There's an HSL, hue, saturated, and luminance panel. So if you want to start messing with the saturation or something, luminance of certain colors, you can do that. There's a little picker here where if I go and select something and start moving them, just by sliding it up and down, it will select the colors for you. There's a color grading tool, which is pretty new, which basically lets you change Depending on the highlight, saturation, and midtones, you can basically do that white balance just for certain parts of your photo. So let's see what else we got. Detail, you have sharpening, noise reduction. Those could be classes all by themselves. If you have a supported lens, you can select some things here and it will automatically correct for lens distortion. I have a little question for that. So, so when I shoot with my 850, the lens correction always does something. 
So I don't know what it does, but it does something. So when I shoot with my mirrorless cameras, it doesn't do that. So what, is there a reason for that? Uh, Adobe may not know your actual, you know, it may not have the lenses or your camera in their database. Okay. So it only works for certain popular lens camera combinations. You but, have, it, but the interesting thing, it detects the lens that I use with my A50, but it doesn't do anything when I use my the mirrorless camera. Yeah, the mirrorless may not be in the database. I don't know. Okay. It's... It, it, it's, it says when I use the tool, it says it's built in, okay. Oops. You know, your camera may do it itself too. Some of them do, so maybe it doesn't need to do anything. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, you'd have to research a particular camera to see what the deal is for that. There's effects, which is basically gives you the vignetting. So if you want a photo that's one way or the other vignetted, you can do that. You can add grain if you like that kind of look. There's a calibration panel, which I found if you increase the red saturation, it helps a lot of photos. But other than that, you want to make sure you're at the most current version, which you will be until a new version comes out. And then you might want to increase the version number if you want to reprocess your file. So those are basically the other panels here. If I were to go to this photo and I'm in library module, I can hit the letter I or do it through the view menu and it will cycle through the name of the actual file name on my computer, the date and time and the resolution of the photo. I hit it again, it gives me the camera settings, the EXIF information. I hit it again, it goes away. But since this was taken with a cell phone, if I go to map, it will show me exactly where it was taken. Do some cameras have built-in GPSs besides cell phones? Some do, most don't. Some of them, a lot of them, you can get an external GPS that sits on your hot shoe or connects to your camera somehow. Mm -hmm. um, so I know sometimes when I'm out shooting, if I wanna remember where I'm at, I'll have my regular camera and then I'll also make sure I take a cell phone photo. So that way I can get the map. Yes, and there's a way you can actually copy the GPS coordinates to your other photos too, to have them in there if you want. Well, but a long time since I've done that, so I don't remember the exact steps, but. We don't need to go into that. Yeah, there's a lot of fancy stuff you can do. Um, so, So talk to me, Bruce, about all of these folders that you have over here on your left. What is your thought process for when you input pictures? So I like putting my actual photos in folders that I can go find them later. If I know, you know, I'm thinking of a particular photo, I want to go find it. So I store everything by location because most of the time I know where the photo was taken. So if I'm thinking, well, there was a big balanced rock over here. I know it was taken at Lee's Ferry. So I come over here and I find it. You know, other people may have, you know, different filing techniques that work better for them, but this is what works for me. Okay. So personally, I keep it by location. 
there have been a couple times when something's got misfiled and I had a hard time finding it, but I did that and fixed it later. You can have it automatically when you import it, do it by date too, which I do for Zion, which doesn't really help me find stuff. It just kind of keeps them separated a little bit because I'm no good at remembering when I took a photo. You know, for other people, it may be different than that. They may, you know, have a good sense. <laughs> so, okay. Now, I got one more slide to show you. And then, if you want, we can actually go process some real photos. I've got a camera, I haven't downloaded my photos for a couple of weeks. We could go through the whole process and run through a few of them if we got time here. But I think we do. Okay. So one last slide I wanted to talk about was the Lightroom Mobile. I find this useful, but not for editing my photos. I have no desire to make adjustments or edits on my photos with a tiny three inch screen or even a 10 inch screen on my tablet. So this is not what I use it for. I use it for three other things. <laughs> you can automatically sync photos between Lightroom Classic and Lightroom Mobile. And I do this, I select a few photos to sync and basically gives me a small portfolio of my work on my phone that I can show people when I'm out and about if somebody asks about a certain location or something. Um, basically to sync them, I'm just not gonna, when you, when you come down to the collections here, you just check the little box at the far left and it will sync that collection. So you put them into a collection and it will sync them to Lightroom Mobile and then it will sync them up to your phone running Lightroom Mobile. So, What little thing are you clicking to make them sync? There's a, can you, I don't know if you can see it when I zoom in or not, but there's a little check mark there. Oh, okay. So you select the collections you want to sync to the cloud. And of course you've only have so much cloud space. So you want to be sparing with that. So, And I also have my phone set up. So when I take a photo, it automatically gets imported to Lightroom Mobile, and then it gets synced back to my desktop Lightroom Classic. So when I take a picture with my phone, it magically appears on my desktop, which is kind of nice. In and also, camera. if you happen to use the camera app inside of Lightroom Mobile, you have the option of shooting raw which the normal photo apps usually don't have that option. And that's available on most phones. I'm not sure about all of them. So it does have its use other than, you know, than editing photos. But what does it do to your battery life? If you use the app in the Lightroom to shoot your photos so that you have raw? Um, I've never really done that i usually don't bother shooting raw because i can just double click my little button on my phone and it automatically pops up the camera and that's a lot easier okay but even those magically appear on my desktop when i get home i take my phone i plug it in if it needs a charge i start lightroom mobile and just let it set and it will automatically upload them to the cloud and then a few minutes later, I go to my desktop and start that, and they get downloaded from the cloud, and there they are. Hmm. So if you go to the file manager, so say I wanted to create a new folder. So I'll create a new folder here. 
which is empty because I just traded it. I take my little camera out of the case. Pop out the SD card, plug it into my little card reader on my desktop here. And the import dialog automatically shows up. I'm not touching a thing. On the right, it lets me select where I'm going to import it to. And it's in this new folder I just created. I tell it to import. And it starts reading them off my card, copying them to my computer. There's a little progress bar at the top. You can go do other things if you have a million photos you're important and you don't want to wait for it. But we're And it's done. So now if I look at my new folder, it has 159 photos on it. So what I usually do is leaf through them really quick. Like I'll probably hit, like this one, I must have hit the button when I wasn't thinking. And so what I do on that is I press the letter X, it sets it as rejected. It puts a little black flag up there. This says, okay, I'm really gonna delete this. So I'll delete that one because I got a person's head in there. <laughs> That's a little out of focus, I'll hit X. So when I get through all of them and I want to get rid of them, I forget what the, where it's at in the menu, but you hit command delete. And those are the three that I marked to be deleted. I want to delete from disk. I don't want to leave them on my disk and just take them on the Lightroom. And those photos are gone. So delete from disk takes them both off your disk and off a of Lightroom. Right. If you just had, if you just say delete, remove from Lightroom, it leaves them on your disk, which is just taking up space, which is, you know, kind of worthless, pointless. So. Um, if I were to really do it, I would delete a whole bunch of these. We saw Igret down by the river that I kept walking closer until he finally flew away. With <laughs> got chased by a dog. <laughs> so I can see right away that these are probably X, X. But anyway. If you make a mistake, you can hit the little flag button, which is a tilde or the back quote or something. It's in the upper left of your keyboard. <laughs> Unmark them, but um, And if I go back to the develop module, you'll notice these sliders are not at zero because I told it to do an auto during import. I have that set up. So I don't have to hit that little auto button anymore. It saves me a click. And I'm a big fan of user presets. If you find yourself doing the same adjustment a lot, I create a preset for it. So with this camera, I know 
what a certain amount of sharpening it should have and things like that. So I'll press this little preset here, which will move a few more of my sliders. And I can still maybe bump up the shadow so I can see that dark dude there. Um, and then if I wanted to post this on social media or something, I could crop it a little bit if I wanted to. So can you go through the, the basic sliders and kind of just show what they do in the sense of like what would happen if you move the contrast slider or the highlights? Because since you did all preset, what what do all of these things do? What well, do they look like if you go to the extremes? Yeah, you know, exposure is pretty self-explanatory. You can make it really bright or really dark or somewhere in between. <laughs> I can double click it to use zero, which is what the camera uses. Contrast. If you want to separate the dark from the lights a little bit, you can move. Sliders go both directions, so I can reduce contrast or add contrast. The highlights will basically reduce the exposure of the highlights in the photo. But if it's set too high, you'll see that white alpaca is all blown out. So sometimes you want to bring down the highlights a little bit to get some detail there. Same for shadows. If the shadows are black, you get silhouettes for the dark items, or you can bring the shadows up, the exposure and just the shadows. So you can get some detail. Whites and blacks are kind of like, this, Similar, except it's more extreme. It's hard to, I don't know how to explain that. Um, there is a trick that if you hold the shift down and double click it, it will set it for you according to your histogram. Basically set your white point and black point. Texture gives you some more texture and you know, the fuzzy parts of your photo. Clarity is kind of a mid-range contrast. Dehaze. If you want to, people use it mainly to blow up their sky or if you have smoke or something in there. So you can really get crazy with that really quick. Some of these a little bit goes a long way. Saturation will basically boost up your colors a lot or Hold all the way down and you have a cheap black and white. Vibrance is like saturation, except it tries to avoid lighter skin tone colors. So you can bump up the background of people without making their faces turn orange. Um, white balance. Basically, you know, you're setting your color temperature, which you can do by sliders too. You can make it warmer or colder or something more natural. <laughs> what about the eyedropper? Uh, if you click on that, and if you have something which is a neutral gray in your photo, you can use that to pick a spot. Since I didn't include a gray card in this photo, you know, You'd have to play around and click some different places till you found a good, good spot to use. Okay. So Let me see if I've got a photo here that actually has a horizon in it. Another useful one, if I go back to develop, is transform. A lot of times if I hit auto or level, it will straighten the horizon of my shot, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. 
But if you have a clearly defined horizon, it usually works pretty good, which is, you know, auto and level are usually the same, but there's different options you can play with. You can move things around yourself if you want. Usually if I'm gonna do that, I'll just go to crop and then you can, once you get the little icon, I can straighten my horizon this way and it will show me a grid. That I can line up or you can actually pick the angle and draw it along your horizon. It will make that part that you've driven, you know, level. Sometimes your horizon is not always perfectly level if your horizons are mountains or something. So you kind of have to eyeball it. So a lot of times if I'm shooting and I just want to add a few photos to Facebook. I'll just pick the ones I want, hit a couple presets, and it's usually good enough for what I'm doing here. So if I wanted to get picky with these, Probably get rid of those with the sticks. <laughs> so this is where you want to delete from disk, not remove from Lightroom, which is a default. If you see a particular photo in here you want me to mess with, I can do that too. Do the one with the bird and the dog. That one? Yeah. This one I would probably crop in so the bird's a little bigger. Yeah, and you can change your Go back to crop here. You can change from landscape to portrait mode just by hitting the X key. What if I want to do like a five by seven instead of a four by six? Ah. You select your aspect ratio to whatever you want it to be. And you can unlock it so you can have any so it's not constrained by the aspect ratio so you can do anything you want the ocd part of me usually leaves it at some standard unless i'm doing a big panorama or something yeah, you can bump up the contrast a little bit if you Maybe bring down the highlights a little more because the bird's kind of white there. You know, this... I could play with the blacks if I wanted to make the dog a more of a silhouette, but that happens to mess with the rest of the photos. So there's the rest of the image. So in the develop module, you've been playing with it and you talked about the fact that you're never saving it. Right. So what if I get to the point where I've done stuff and I'm just like, oh my gosh, I really don't like this. 
Where okay. can I go to get back to square one? Square one is down here at the bottom. There's a reset button. Do that. Okay. So what if I don't want to do that totally, but I want to go back a few steps? Scroll all the way to the bottom. And you have a history of every change you've made. And you can back up as far as you want. See all the different crops I made. Mm -hmm. Or all the way back to import. And that's and the beauty of Lightroom, right? That, that's one of the beauties of Lightroom is that you never really change that original photo. Yeah. So if I, the photo looks like this now. If I right click and I show, show this photo in Finder, it's this photo right here. Since that's a raw photo, I don't know if it'll let me view it or not. See, okay, I just hit the quick view and on Mac, and it shows me the original photo that's on the disk, and it's totally untouched by Lightroom. But this is how it looks in Lightroom. Now, if I'm ready to put this on Facebook or something, I can go to export. It'll bring up the export dialog. You can create presets here too, if you want. So for Facebook, I export it to the desktop. You can put it in any folder you want. I can rename it if I want to. If I want to make it a JPEG with that color space, 75% quality, the more you compress it or less compress it depending on the quality of the photo. I resize to 1280 pixels. So if you wanna reduce the size a little bit because you don't need them huge for Facebook, you can apply a bit more sharpening if you want. You can say which metadata gets included in the photo. So if you wanna strip the metadata out of your photo so people can't look up all the metadata. So if you have GPS coordinates in there and they could look those up depending on where you post it. Facebook strips them all out anyway, but some programs don't. You can put a watermark, you can create your own watermark, edit them. And then after you get done, show it in Finder. So if I hit export here, pops up Finder and there's my exported photo which looks like the processed one. And I upload that to Facebook, delete it. I want it again, I just export it again. <laughs> Can you show us the export from the library module? Because I don't see how you're getting to it the way you're doing it. Like over there now, there it says export. Oh, yeah, you can do it that way. Yeah, that's how I do it. Okay. You can do it just that just way. You can, you can right click and go export. Okay. You can export it with the preset if you know what preset you want. So like with most programs, there are multiple ways to do the same thing. That's the import dialog is if you wanna add, up here, you can add photos to Lightroom that are already on your hard drive or you can copy them off an SD card or you can copy them off and convert them to Adobe's DNG format. And that's really slow. <laughs> Cancel. Why would you want to do that? Do what? 
the DNG? Um, I don't know. You'll find a lot of different opinions on the internet. But for somebody who's beginning, it's just a copy feature, right? Just a copy. You just go copy. Yeah, you can move them off your, which deletes them from your memory card at the same time, but I don't recommend doing that. Leave them on your memory card until you have them backed up. You have your computer backed up and the photos backed up and then erase the memory card by format that in the camera, which is the best way to not corrupt your memory cards. If you start adding and deleting a lot of things without formatting, you stand your chances of corrupting the memory card go up. So. Anything else that you've got planned? Should we open it up for questions? Yeah, questions are good. Or anything you want him to go over again or to go through a little more slowly? Yeah, I went through it kind of quick, but. So I've got a question. I may not have always been using delete off disk. Okay. How can I go and clean up my hard drive? How can I compare what I want to keep in Lightroom and what's on the catalog? Um, Is there an easy way or am I going to just have to painfully go through and compare? Or, do, or should I just not worry about it? This is a real life situation, people. <laughs> okay, some of the I tricks think. in the library module is you right click on that and tell it to synchronize folder. Okay. And this doesn't show me anything, but actually let's do something here. So let's take this one, delete it. Hit command delete and just remove it from Lightroom. I go back here to Lightroom Classic folder, right click on the folder, tell it to synchronize folder. And it found one photo in this directory that's not in Lightroom. So I can bring it back into Lightroom. And there it is. And, and it also appears in the previous import catalog um, collection. So now I can hit X again here, command delete, and do the right thing. Thank you. And you can do that for your whole catalog. So I could do that for all 151,000 photos I have, but it might be quicker to do it in smaller chunks, but. Might be more manageable. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any questions or comments from anybody else? Yeah, the question for the export. So I saw you you use like seventy five percent. So you know, you, if you go up to like one hundred, it's you know your picture is like fifteen megabytes or something. So what is your experience when you have if you want to have a nice decent quality uh, printout? So what is, is seven? Well, if I'm going to actually print it, I'll go one hundred percent. Just okay. because, you know, it's not something I do very often, but I'll export it at 100% full resolution, send it off to the printer to be printed or print it myself if I have my own printer. If I'm going to post it on Facebook, I'll reduce the size and try different options, you know, go 75%, go 50%, see how low you can go before you tell the difference. You know, and then bump it up so you have a decent, you know, it's trial and error. Because yeah. I, to, to be honest, I really don't see a big difference between 
75 percent and 30 percent when you post it on facebook or so. yeah you know facebook is going to compress it again too so mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know it's kind of a trial and error thing i don't mm -hmm. worry too much about it because i exported it at 75 percent i uploaded it to facebook and then i deleted it off my computer so it really doesn't matter <laughs> okay the, the smaller size will upload quicker to facebook but that's about the only advantage mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay thanks Mm -hmm. And I've noticed uh, some printers will have on their website what they suggest for sizing mm -hmm. um, for to get a good print. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, if I the other thing here, let me look at a couple of photos. Um, I talked about the file manager. So if I want to, when I get done processing these photos, or at least the ones I want to keep, so these photos were taken this morning. I know where I took them. So I want to use Lightroom's file managers to drag them over to the folder that they're supposed to go in, if I can find it here. And it asked me some stupid question I never read, and I just hit move, and it will take them out of here and <laughs> pluck them over in that folder. So, the neat thing about when you import it, before I did that synchronize, <laughs> They were all in the previous collection. So usually I import them straight into the folder where I know they're going. If they're from two or more locations, I'll pick one and then I'll just move half of them to the real folder when I get done and just process them right out of the import. So Any other questions from anyone? Hmm. Are there specific topics uh, in Lightroom that people would like more in-depth looks at or more in-depth training on that we could do like, you know, 10, 15 minutes on importing photos or exporting photos or what have you. Is there any comments of any topics that we would like to expound on? Nope, okay. Next question, does anybody have any other softwares that they're comfortable doing a similar situation with? I know Photoshop is huge, but I'm thinking like Luminar, or some of the other um, ones that people like to use. 